Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Institute of International and European Affairs, I'd like to welcome you to today's event on Cities and Climate Action Perspectives from Dublin and Marseille. This event is co-organized by the Institute of International and European Affairs and the Embassy of France in Ireland. We will have opening remarks from the Ambassador of France in Ireland, His Excellency Vincent Guerin. There will then be keynote remarks from the Lord Mayor of Dublin, Hazel Chu, and from the Deputy Mayor of Marseille, Michel Rubirola. And I will then chair a discussion with the Mayor and the Deputy Mayor. And after that, we will open up the event to questions from the floor. We expect to conclude by around 2 p.m. Irish time. As the Deputy Mayor will be speaking in French, we are providing interpretation for today's event. One interpreter will translate from French to English, another from English to French. To avail of this service, you should click on a small globe icon, which you will find at the bottom of your screen. If you're using a tablet, you will find the icon by clicking on more in the upper right hand corner of the screen. If you're using a phone, a pop up should appear, which will give you access. Select English or French to hear the interpreter of your choice. And uh, by the way, these instructions about the uh, interpretation will be available in the chat box also. Please feel free to ask questions at any point during the event as they occur to you, and we will do our best to get to these within the time available. You can use the Q&A function on the Zoom, and please identify yourself when you're putting in a question. The event is fully on the record, it will be live streamed on YouTube. And for those of you using Twitter, the handles are at IIEA and at France in Ireland. I'd now like to invite the French ambassador, Vincent Guerin, to deliver some opening remarks. Vincent, vous avez la parole. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much, David. Um, Lord Mayor, uh, Madame la Maire, dear participants, chers amis. I'm very pleased to be able to introduce uh, today's discussion entitled uh, Cities and uh, Climate Action Perspectives from Dublin and Marseille, co-organized by uh, the Institute for International and European Affairs and the French Embassy in Ireland. Transforming lives while protecting the planet, thus is the objective of uh, the SDG 2030 agenda. During the Zero Carbon Forum held in Paris uh, in December 2020, the mayors of major international cities signed the Paris Declaration. This document reiterates uh, major cities' commitment to take concrete action in order to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius and to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 at the latest. At a time when more than half of the world's population lives in cities, when climate change is accelerating, and when we are going through a global pandemic, I would like to express my deepest thanks to Mrs. Michelle Rubilera, uh, Deputy Mayor to the City of Marseille, and Hazel Chu, Lord Mayor of Dublin. These are two uh, committed environmentalists and I would like to thank both of them for sharing their experience and their vision for more resilient and fair cities. And this for our uh, fellow citizens. Marseille and Dublin, two ports facing the world, two cities with comparable population sizes where nature is truly at the city's doorstep. Walking in the Calanque National Park or on uh, the hiking trails of uh, the island of Hoth gives us the same feelings of beauty and freedom and this at the doors of the city. And of course, we know that both of you are deeply committed to preserving and developing this environment and this extraordinary natural framework. It is therefore with a great deal of interest that I will follow this debate and I thank you for this. We're delighted to have with us as our guest today, the Lord Mayor of Dublin and the Deputy Mayor of Marseille. Uh, Hazel Chu was elected the uh, 352nd Lord Mayor of Dublin in June of last year. She's the ninth woman to hold this office. 
She is a councillor of the Green Party and she has been chair of the party since 2019. Michel Rubirola has been the deputy mayor of Marseille since December of last year. She was elected as mayor in July uh, of, of last year. She has been a member of the Green Party there since 2002, and she's had a particular focus on improving ecological sustainability and housing access in Marseille. I'm delighted to invite Lord Mayor Chu to speak to us first. Lord Mayor, you have the floor. Thank you, David, and thank you, Mr. Ambassador, and uh, thank you to uh, Madam Deputy Mayor and all the guests here today. So we're here to talk about um, our cities and how we're adapting in relation to uh, climate change and the climate action that we are trying to enact while during COVID during this difficult period. So I guess from my part, I'd like to take a back a bit and look at the basics first of why globally we've acknowledged that the central role in responding to climate change and how it is down to our local governments uh, to, to roll out these roles. But I, I think this, this is normally missed by a lot of people because a lot of people look at the national framework and go, well, uh, once the climate bill is in or climate, uh, such climate action plan is in, then that's done. But I, I guess what we've noticed in the last decade is how such framework applies to local authority and why this is important because local governments rising to the challenge and taking action for the barriers uh, and um, to understand what uh, is needed is essential and especially when we look at each of our cities and in particular in Dublin uh, Marseille that we're talking about. Um, in terms of our city. So a bit of context on, on background for our local authorities. So the Irish government's national Adap adaptation framework, which emerged from the Climate Action and Low Carbon Development Act 2015, tasked key national government departments with the development of statutory sectoral adaptation. And under NAF, what was required is that Ireland's local authority completed climate adaptation strategies in 2019. And these included Dublin, Cork, Galway, Limerick, Waterford. And Dublin, in its itself then was split into four local authorities. Uh, this is just giving some context, I guess, to our audience who I'm looking at the list here. A lot of them are a lot more well first in this than I am. So, uh, uh, and this is why I think framing it in what we've done from a local authority perspective is very important because we were tasked with this and we've responded to, to different aspects of this. And what has happened in terms of uh, from the DLA, from the uh, Dublin local authorities, we call them the DLAs, uh, the, from the signatory of mayors to uh, the response, the more recent response, we've noticed that there has been a intense change, especially in the last 12 months. And I, I, I my part of wanting to be part of this conversation was to hear those changes coming from Marseille as well, because I've been watching those changes across Europe, be it from a nighttime economy perspective and how we reform uh, the economy to uh, the climate um, change, uh, to <clears throat> sorry, the pressing climate chaos that we have and the climate action that we need. And it's, it's, it's heartening to see that we are reacting to the crisis of COVID and we are re reacting and planning in terms of COVID on a strategy for, for uh, our European cities. For Dublin itself, so uh, looking at the challenges, we, we know our challenges of close flooding, low temperatures, strong winds, high temperatures, low rainfall, all, and, and, and these extreme kind of weather um, different risk factors, but our sea level and our coastal floodings are a huge risk to us. And this is where I think um, it's been particularly good to see the great work done by Dublin City in terms of what we have done for, for um, mitigating against the the sea level risk. So DCC is actively working with neighborhood, neighboring at local authorities to achieve a regional approach to flood resilience. The Dublin-based Sentinel Group has been successfully established and is working to address coastal flood risk and sea level rises in Dublin Bay. There are approximately 15 flood alleviation projects underway in the region along the rivers Camac, 
Tolka, Dodder, Liffy, e, Poddle, Wad, and Santry. And uh, sorry, Mad uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, I'm sure those names mean nothing whatsoever to yourselves. But I think to a lot of Dubliners here, they would see it and they would understand the the uh, flood alleviations with um, uh, with the OPW is really vital in seeing how we manage to contain flood risk. Um, and in terms of then the projects, there's also the EU floods directive and water uh, framework directive as well. And, and specifically, I guess, to COVID, I know I'll be running short of time soon, but we will be going back to talk about flooding later on in this conversation and air pollutants. But I think one of the things I'm most proud of when it comes to uh, COVID. And it's hard to associate that word proud and COVID because it's it's a time of loss and grieving and, and, and suffering. But there has been so much that we've done as a city in terms of sustainability, in terms of uh, fighting climate change. First and foremost, if you look at our COVID mobility, so it, it is a proven fact that uh, air, air that um, through a nature report recently showed that the spread of COVID and transmission is, is uh, at quicker rate during a city that is more polluted. And as such, tr trying to reduce our pollutants is essential. And one of our COVID mobility aims, apart from to provide safer, sustainable transport across Dublin for everyone, is also to reduce uh, the dependency on cars and re reduce emissions and per, uh, provide better air quality overall. So what we have rolled out across the city for people who are unfamiliar is the mitigation of uh, trying to keep people safe of providing uh, segregated lanes by providing wider footpaths. I know this theme sounds very straightforward when you come from a European city that has all those facilities, but if you look at um, Dublin in February 20, 20 a lot uh, we we didn't have a lot of uh, desegregated lanes and and sustainable modes of transport uh, transport it's been a modal shift in this year alone and this shift has provided all around better air quality has provided more sustainable travel but has provided a mindset a mindset sorry, for apologies, mindset shift among uh, generations. Because what we saw in February 2020 was that a younger generation, a younger cohort was championing what we needed to do when it comes to climate change and climate action. And what we've seen during COVID was a lot of uh, other generations come on board as well and to try to drive that change because they automatically can spot that the inequities of, of what COVID has produced in terms of societal issues and what climate um, climate uh, issues have, ha have highlighted for years and years and we've done nothing about. So the, the opportunity is there for us to do something and part of what we need to do and has been very clear for a while now is how we reform the planning as well of the city as well as looking at things like how we put in our climate action plan and we we are the SDGs are integrated into our Dublin City Council climate change action plan but what we also need is a um, is a revision of how we plan and live in the city so that the city itself then becomes a more integrated inclusion uh, inclusive city but that benefits directly the climate emergency that we are trying to to uh, change and affect and act on and on that note I guess we will have further discussions on the various uh points about, as I said, flooding pollutants and other SDGs. But I guess I'm I'm at a point where I am hopeful. I, I know I get asked this a, a lot that with the amount of um, loss and deaths that we had this year, how do people stay hopeful? And how do we continue to fight this climate emergency when there's so much more at our door in light of COVID? And what I would say is this is the time to act. We've been saying that for a while now that this is always the time to act. but with COVID has brought the opportunity where people understand what loss truly means, when people understand the urgency of when a pandemic is at your door and climate uh, and, and um, the climate issues and climate breakdown we have is that emergency that is voted into the pandemic that people also are starting to realize. So I think this is a, a this is timely in so far, and I'm not calling COVID timely before someone misquotes me and go, oh, uh, she said COVID was timely. What I'm saying is that um, this is our 
our opportunity to step up in terms of leadership across all our cities around the world. Our European uh, cities have, have done so, but it's time that our own uh, coalition partners and government as a whole need to understand this climate bill needs to be passed and needs to be the most ambitious that we've ever had in this state. So thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Lord Mayor. Thank you, Hazel, for those remarks. I must say I was particularly struck by the, the links you draw between the climate emergency and COVID. There's a, a lot of food for thought there. And now I, I have great pleasure in turning to Michelle Rubirola, who is the Deputy Mayor of Marseille. Madame la Maire Rejointe, vous avez la parole. Merci. Bonjour à, à toutes et tous. Hi everyone, and first of all, I wanted to thank uh, uh, the ambassador for your uh, to invite uh, for inviting me, and I'm delighted to discuss with uh, Mrs. Chu, the mayor of Dublin. And first of all, I wanted to say that a lot of what you said um, uh, is the same for me. I can see we share common values. So thank you very much for your speech. First of all, as an introduction, I wanted to tell you a bit more about my city and my commitment as well. I don't know if some of you are aware. Uh, I don't know if you know Marseille or not, but it's located uh, on the Mediterranean Sea and it's the second biggest city in France in terms of population with uh, uh, over 240 uh, square kilometers, that is to say twice as much as Paris, in fact. And in fact, the environment and the climate are exceptional with 38% of natural areas, 57% of coastal area, and most importantly, 300 days of sun every year. We are lucky because we can enjoy natural locations. Uh, you mentioned it in your introduction. You mentioned the Parc Naturel des Calanques, and it's true that I am aware that uh, they are uh, world famous. Marseille is also the oldest city in France. The architecture, the current architecture, and the population reflect more than 2,600 years of history. Marseille is a city that welcomes people and the, where there's a lot of immigration from the Mediterranean as well. And over time, it builds a strong identity. It benefits from a multicultural uh, culture around 111 uh, villages. And it's specific because it's got no suburbs as such because there are hills all around uh, as well as the sea. So um, the city cannot actually um, spread. To summarize, I would say that Marseille is a city that is turned towards the sea. It's a link between Europe, the Mediterranean, uh, of the south, uh, southern Mediterranean and Africa, and has a great historical uh, um, wealth. It's very dynamic economically speaking, and with an exceptional uh, natural location. I love this city and these people, and this is the reason why I committed, in fact. I committed as a woman, as a doctor, and I want to fight for um, eco-friendly and solidarity values to face the uh, various uh, numerous uh, uh, challenges in Marseille. You've heard about education and housing that uh, are a priority for us, and because it's a very difficult area and but these priorities do not mean that we do not want to build a city that would be greener more sustainable and fairer why fairer because Marseille has been suffering for a very long time too long in fact about uh, inequalities in the territories between uh, the northern part of the city where there is no coastal area or it's basically dedicated to the port, the harbor. And it also suffers this northern area from pollution due to the ships, the boats. And there's wealthier areas in the south with about 20 beaches with traditional harbors, fishing harbors. And our will is to reconcile those territories so that inhabitants from the north and the north and the south have access to the same opportunities, same public services and the sea and all they can benefit from. So as you understand, I said I committed as a, as a doctor and obviously health and especially for the weakest population is at the heart of my concern. And I want to be, a, create a link between 
exposure to uh, pollution and sanitary consequences on the population. And this is more frequent in the north, obviously. I also uh, want to create a link um, with the uh, social and environmental challenges that you already mentioned, Ms. Uh, Ms. Chu, have to face climate, ch um, climate change and reduce our dependency on fossil energies and obviously reduce as much as possible the impact on biodiversity, uh, as well as improving the quality of the uh, marine life. And how can we do that? Well, obviously, the means might not be as um, great as in the north of Europe, but how can we use technological solutions in particular? We have to find a balance between technological, creative technological solutions that are very costly and preventive solutions based on, um, obviously, incentives uh, for uh, changes in behaviors. So we have to reinforce renewable energies and also do energy savings. The best energy is the energy you do not use. So we have to push inhabitants to, um, re to reduce their use of polluting transport modes and develop um, public transport, uh, cycling, safe cycling paths, but also we have to re review our urban organization to reduce um, traveling needs. So I'm, I mentioned I have 111 villages, and in fact, we have different districts, and this means we can have this um, functional mix and establish a better balance to recreate social links as well. What we have to do is support the population in reducing their energy consumption for heating and cooling by um, renovating houses and buildings, but also by um, uh, living outdoors uh, with uh, trees, even when it's very hot outside and adopting uh, local sources, uh, re local resources for thermal um, stages to cool and heat buildings. And lastly, something that um, cities don't, uh, well, have been tackling recently, whereas for me, it's a major environmental stakes as well, sanitary and social, that is, uh, in fact, overlapping with the numerous skills of the cities, that is to say, sustainable food, promoting a healthy um, food um, habits that are balanced, local, and obviously make them accessible to all. This requires not that many technologies and investments at all, but obviously it goes against the uh, practices that have been developed over the past decades by the agri-food industry. And this is what we saw, in fact, with the pandemics and the lockdown. In fact, lockdown uh, showed that it was necessary to go more local for uh, sourcing resources, especially for food, food resources. So obviously, uh, to implement such type of solutions and complementary, you have to involve all stakeholders, local authorities, companies, associations, researchers, so that there be stakeholders in the transformation of our cities and uh, territorial innovation and co-building of this uh, future city in, in which each one of us will, will um, be aware that their well-being is related to others and that on the one hand, you have the benefits that obviously you are losing on the other side. So collective mobilization from all stakeholders around a project that is shared is more efficient than a, full, a, const a political constraints. You shouldn't um, impose things on people. You have to make sure that they uh, are involved in this change. And this is what I wanted to do in Marseille, put human beings at the heart of the process um, and to, to, to avoid losing people. Thank you very, very much for that uh, fascinating account of how Marseille is tackling the uh, big challenges of climate change and other sustainability challenges. Thank you very much indeed. I'd now like to open our short discussion uh, uh, among ourselves before we turn to the questions from the audience. Um, an initial question which relates to the sustainable development goals, as it happens, I have a personal connection with the SDGs, when I was Ireland's ambassador to the UN a few years ago, it fell to me to co-chair the negotiations with my Kenyan colleague, which led to the adoption of the SDGs. So I follow their progress with great interest. One of the goals, uh, SDG 11, pledges to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. If I may, I'd like to ask each of you 
how you have incorporated this goal into the frameworks for governing your respective cities. Uh, Hazel, Lord Mayor, could I perhaps begin with you to describe how, uh, how Dublin is faring in that respect? So uh, thanks, David, and thank you, Madam Mayor, for, for I think uh, you highlighted there a lot of what we are doing similar, but that there's a lot of learnings as well from, from each European city to the next, but that the aspiration was there, is there. So that's absolutely brilliant to hear. For me, the, um, it's not even for me, for Dublin City Council, the SC3s are integral, integrated into the uh, Climate Change Action Plan 2019 uh, to 2024. Uh, and the corporate plan for the council as well and will be forthcoming in our development plan so we've kicked up a new iteration of the city development plan from 2022 to 2028 so so specifically on our climate action uh climate change action plan it's making dublin a climate resilient city is a key target but in terms of integration and what you said there david on how it affects community on the ground level and that it's through every aspect of what we do. There's also a separate uh, integration plan and inclusion plan for Dublin as well. That's part, part of our um, public sector duty. So, so in terms of what you, you stated there on how a city works in terms of integration, in terms of building that resilient community, that's already, it's already embedded in, in uh, a or public sector duty, but B uh, in a plan that we're developing. Actually, I'm I'm one of the people that are leading the plan with our integration office as well. And what we've noticed, this comes back to to the inequities we see in society. That uh, COVID has highlighted those inequities, and this is something we're trying to make sure that we fix. And it's not building back better because building back better uh, infers that the back was good, as in what was before was good. When what COVID has highlighted is that there are huge issues that we need to build forward for and climate action being embedded in those. Thank you very much for that, Hazel. Um, Madam Deputy Mayor, could I ask you to describe the uh, Marseille perspective? Oui, bien sûr. Très bien, sure. merci. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the floor. Well, first, what I wanted to say is that just after we joined, I declared that Marseille was in, in an emergency state from a climate point of view because we are exposed to uh, climate change and to pollution. As Mrs. Chu said, we have a lot of crises where social, environmental, economic and the sanitary crisis that we've been through is a reminder of that. And Marseille, in fact, just like the whole area around the Mediterranean, is a specific species ecosystem that is very vulnerable. So there was an emergency to take action. This is why we decided to build a roadmap, an ambitious roadmap, in fact, that will select the major stretching projects that uh, combine uh, technical solutions and solutions based on nature and societal changes and uh, participation as well. And our strategy that is focused towards the ecological transition will tackle um, um, refits and then um, energy um, reduction, as I said in my introduction. And Marseille uh, has got a lot of sun, for example, and a lot of wind as well as it's the case today. So we can use renewable energy and our strategy is also based on uh, fighting against pollution. As you said, Mrs. Chu, you, you mentioned the link between the development uh, of the city and uh, air pollution. So we'll try to reduce as much as possible, as I was saying before, um, uh, car uh, transport uh, in particular. We will also we'll also have a common issue that is to say the port activity. It represents more than 40% of the pollution, the air pollution in our area. So we have to rethink tourism and focus it on more local type of tourism. And that is uh, more beneficial to inhabitants in Marseille. Marseille, if you know it, is it's a city that is uh, well, that is full of trees, and we shouldn't forget that. So we tend to forget that one of the major risks is, in fact, the uh, heat waves. I mean, people might die from heat. So, I mean, the trees are actually essential. It's the only way we can fight canicules and heat waves in the future. So to 
cool down the cities. In fact, we noticed that the, the, the difference if you're next to a park or if you're in the middle of, of uh, the building. So there's about six degrees difference. So it's, it's actually a major issue. We also want to, um, uh, want to make sure that the grounds uh, can be uh, renovated to prevent flooding. You mentioned it as well. And we want to reduce the temperature in grounds. I mean, like in yards in, in primary schools. In fact, in the whole cities, we have schools everywhere. And for our schools, in fact, we want to turn them into um, coolness islands, if you wish. So put, uh, putting trees and uh, making sure that the grounds uh, can absorb the uh, rainfall. And we also want to think of the the use of fishing in the sea. Marseille is a pioneer in terms of uh, artificial uh, reefs and we have a marine biodiversity which is quite unique and we want to fight industrial fishing and we want to uh, develop um, other types of uh, participative um, fishing. And we also have, uh, we also want to uh, protect places um, in the cities with uh, major biodiversity that is essential. So uh, we want to bring a bit of wilderness in the city, basically, and leave spaces free from any kind of human activity. We also want to uh, start a revolution in terms of um, agriculture as well, uh, by dedicating some of it to local uh, consumption based on uh, um, short loops to also feed uh, restaurants and schools and canteens. It, it will not be enough, but it will contribute to it. And we also believe that having a uh, uh, common uh, gardens, for example, is very important because we said we have to push people to change their behaviors. And I think the more we create um, shared gardens, for example, and the more we bring people to garden together, and if they can understand the benefits from and they can feel with their hands in the in the earth you know and they can see their vegetable grow uh, this will actually change their behaviors for good and so and kids in particular will be in contact uh, of nature and this can really make a difference so we want to put gardens in schools as well to raise awareness um, in, especially with the, the new uh, generation to new consumption practices. In a nutshell, as you can see, obviously, we want to um, place this uh, revolution everywhere and we also have to co-design this uh, approach with the inhabitants and for the inhabitants. I turn now to the issue of air pollution, which we've touched on a little bit. Uh, it's a good example of overlap between uh, public health and environmental concerns. This is particularly so at the present time with the huge challenge posed by the pandemic. Do your cities have a strategy for addressing issues around urban air quality? Hazel, could I begin with you, please? Absolutely, David. Um, we do. So I think uh, we've spotted a long time ago on the, uh, on how we needed to reduce pollutants and how we had to provide our citizens. We were obliged to provide our citizens a better quality of life and air quality is part of that. So we are a signatory of the Who Read Life campaign. So, uh, and we are part of our goals in the Environmental Strategic Policy Committee, which we have is um, air quality and air quality subcommittee is within that. So under the guidance of Who, we've also understood that data is essential in understanding how um, air quality um, uh, works, or not works, but how we can improve it. And what are our main points of combat? Because you can try to tackle a strategy with the whole of the city, or you can pinpoint, well, which are your areas that has the most air pollutants? So under uh, under that, we, we um, decided to set up different areas with uh, air monitoring. And uh, Dublin City Ports is one of the uh, main ones. The, uh, the uh, so with the port uh, itself, we uh, we put in ambient sensors there to understand what the air quality was. So and to monitor, um, it's it's a multi pollutant air monitoring station. It's actually a quite state of the art. So and prior to that. Prior to 2019, our main data was through the EPA, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, and what 
we want now, what we've tried to separate it out now is to intend to uh, put in further stations around Dublin. So there is plans to put in eight uh, further uh, monitoring, air monitoring stations. There is also to the Smart Cities program, and I can't talk a lot about this because it's in the works, but it's a very exciting program to look at real time um, um, dissimulation of data. And from that, then we can understand what are the, the controls that need to be be put into place because there is an air pollution act of in 1987 so to regulate uh, monitor illegal burning and excessive emissions so but once we know where where the hot spots are we can all also understand what is the country uh, contributing factors because a lot of it could be well if we look at it the mode of transport that one takes or the heavy uh, areas and how do you then us as a city make sure that we um uh, we, we, we try to mitigate against that. And that then brings in the, the point I brought in about COVID mobility, how true COVID mobility and the reforming and revision of uh, uh, transport and looking at more sustainable transport options, we've been able to reduce pollutants that way by providing cycle routes, increased park and ride facilities, that's even before COVID, and make sure that our heavy goods vehicles don't come into the city centre. So the banning of HGVs and also so the in implementation of uh, quality bus corridors. And when we look at the new Bus Connects program that will be rolling down out the city in, in uh, the uh, years to come, that again is to help that modal shift, shift to make sure people uh, take public transport more, opt for more uh, sustainable travel so that to reduce car usage and reduce pollutants. So uh, there's also overall greening strategies as well to improve neighborhoods because your biodiversity, your income, increase in, in greening will, will offset as well. So, and that we've seen an increase with, as we've looked at COVID with, with a lot of our communities actually um, coming together more because people now are within their communities more. They're, they're, not, they're less so within the city, like our, the city is completely empty. And what you've noticed in the city is that it's a bit of a donut with a hole, as I call it, where everything is more in the periphery and the center is empty. So now which the next iteration of the, uh, development plans we want to make sure we fill that hole but in the meantime we also want to make sure we support our urban villages and our local communities to make sure that they they are part of the greening strategies when it comes to improving air quality so so we do it from the council level from and also we do it from the community level but i think that's what we we looked at we needed we looked at the need that it has to be tackled from every sector uh, rather than just from the management level Thank you very much, Hazel. Um, could I ask uh, Deputy Lord Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor of Marseille, to indicate how Marseille is approaching the issue of air pollution? Oui, merci, bien sûr. Thank you. Of course, I'd be happy to take that question. So, regarding uh, the way we uh, mitigate uh, air pollution in Marseille. We leverage uh, experimentation tools and ways of uh, reinforcing soft mobility. That, um, for example, deploying more cycling paths and also having better management of cruise ships. And we also have low carbon emission zones that have been um, implemented. And um, these areas, um, low emission areas, um, well, sometimes it can have an impact on um, underprivileged people. But we also want to have limited traffic areas this is important in order to really preserve uh, the villages that I referred to earlier and to preserve the access to the beautiful Calanque. So the way our um, region is um, structured, it hasn't really been uh, modified for a very long time. And so we need to um, have a forward looking um, approach. So not just about repairing uh, what happened in the past, but also truly to prepare ourselves for the future. Uh, Marseille is made up of numerous uh, villages going from north to south. And so traffic was created uh, so that all the villages would converge uh, in the city of Marseille, the port area, but there's no connection between all these little villages. And we need to try to uh, rethink that. So as a Mediterranean city and as a member uh, of the European Union, of course, uh, in 2022, uh, we will be ranked in the ICAD zone 
And so there will be uh, a, a control of uh, sulfur emissions. And Marseille is also located towards uh, the FOSS area, the industrial uh, catchment area. And so uh, people from Marseille uh, do also suffer from um, emissions from uh, Fosse sur Mer, which is an industrial area. So we need to focus on, on that because it's located just about 10 kilometers from Marseille. We really want to implement social justice. So above and beyond my ecological uh, mindset, that's what really motivates me to fight against air pollution because the poorest inhabitants often live in the areas that are most exposed to air pollution. And so we need to help them about port cities, both uh, Marseille and Dublin, as we know, are port cities. And the rise in sea levels and extreme weather events uh, call for adaptation measures in such cities across the world. How, how do you think we can strengthen the resilience of port cities? Uh, can I ask Hazel to comment on that from the Dublin perspective? Well, I think the resilience of port cities is to, well, A, so we, we need to strengthen kind of the, the, well, we need to mitigate against the rising sea levels and have the flood defences in and make sure we have that strategy. So again, back to when we were talking about the various flood defence uh, that we were looking into, but also monitoring and early warning signs is, is essential when we're looking at uh, the, the strengthening the resilience uh, because our, our resilience is, is to make sure that there is um well the port city is there so i think ultimately to 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 put it, put it quite bluntly so how do we protect what is there because well dublin bay uh as some of you may not know but it is um a, a unesco biosphere so it's to make sure we preserve the nature part to uh, to make sure that we have the uh, defense uh part as well and uh, because uh, the data shows very clearly that the uh, sea level rises three to four millimeters per year globally and um our on average rise in dublin bay is around 67 uh, 627 millimeters so that's 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 quite a uh, quite a lot from 2000 to 2016 and what dcc has been looking at is the projects to build the, uh, the defenses so so to build that resilience on ground while protecting the uh, biosphere itself so um i talked about the sentinel group i talked about kind of uh, opw framework previously but there's also the the um climate proofing of, of or projects that's going on on the ground as well there's a lot that when it comes to the communities on ground there's a lot when we look at the smart cities program uh the smart cities program is working with academia and private sector to innovate around flooding so uh deploying low cost sensors no cost network of sensors to monitor rainfall and water levels uh and in the last two years the project called um i'm trying to remember Operandium, so uh, we'll deliver tools and methods to demonstrate kind of um, how we have uh, solutions based on hydro meteorological risks. So, so these are things that we're investing in to show, uh, to not show, but to provide defenses. And there's an overall flood defense strategy that is being applied as well. But back to the early warning, I think there also needs to be the um, resilience is built on knowing that when something is coming and how to protect against that as well. And the Trident and Tidewatch are two early morning or warning systems in Dublin Bay that use sensors to provide for real time. And this is something that um, the, the DCC staff have, 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 have looked to work towards. And what I'm getting at is to build that resilience is going to be hard, getting harder and harder as, as, um, as our sea level increases. But the work we're doing right now is in terms of um, uh, um, providing defense and monitoring early warning. But there needs to be, I'll be the first to say that there needs to be perhaps looking at overseas, what has other cities done in terms of these strategies to build more capability? Because my fear would be, us leaving it too late and you adopting these strategies as something as as we think is, is what we can do right now but there's also a future projection of what we can do in the future to make sure that we we continue to have this port city thanks thank you very much Hazel. Um, madam deputy mayor could i ask you what marseille is doing to strengthen the resilience of 
of its port. I know you've touched on it a little bit, but if you'd like to develop that theme, that would be great. So regarding the effects of uh, climate change on our coastal area, well, Marseille means, uh, due to our topography, we are more concerned about uh, an increase in temperatures rather than an increase in the sea level. Therefore, we need to have international coordination in order to take up these challenges. Because if Marseille has virtuous action, but other, if other cities in, along the Mediterranean rim don't do this, then it will make it difficult for us to achieve our objectives. We share common problems and um, this, the solutions must be borderless as well. Regarding sea level uh, mitigation, what we're going to do is try to have withdrawal from um, the coastal areas rather than continue to build up those coastal areas. The increase in sea level can make uh, flooding uh, risks uh, much greater due to storms. In Marseille, we have a structural problem whereby after strong rain, the, the water in the sea means that people can't go swimming. I talked about um, another issue in the city. There's a lot of waste. A lot of waste uh, comes into the, sometimes comes into the seawater. And so this, uh, this dirty water that is full of waste goes into the sea, which is why we need to really focus on the issue uh, of waste. In addition, we need to uh, improve the, sea, the, the rain drainage system as well as wastewater drainage systems. So the oceans, uh, the coastlines, the fauna and the flora need to be uh, protected for future generations. And that's why we're turning to future generations. We have implemented um, good measures in order to improve participation in the Parc National des Calanques and to enhance biodiversity. And this involves um, scientists, uh, state services, as well as the youth. In fact, uh, school children um, are invited to sponsor artificial um, um, cliffs. And uh, they can do this. Um, they can sponsor these reefs uh, by, and work with uh, scientific divers in doing so. So the World Congress for Nature should uh, take place in Marseille next September. And I would like to uh, extend a warm invitation to Mrs. Chu to this uh, event. And we are hopeful that our method can inspire other regions in the world in which an overly centralized management of nature may have a negative impact on local development, a local development that is responsible and that will guarantee the conservation of resources. And of course, we also hope to learn uh, from best practices from other uh, managers. Uh, some questions posed by our audience. Um, First of all, um, uh, there's one which in a way touches on something, uh, Hazel, that you mentioned a moment ago about how people nowadays under the pandemic are living more and more in their communities. Um, and the question really is, uh, we've been asked to stay in our neighborhoods uh, since the pandemic broke out and, and many of us have become reacquainted with our local environments and have taken a renewed interest in their well-being. Have you noticed a change in citizen awareness of an engagement with sustainable initi initiatives since the pandemic began? Could I put that one to you first, Hazel? Yeah, absolutely. There has been, like I look at groups, uh, there's a group called uh, Pocket Forest, which is again, a community led project by, by uh, a resident of Dublin 8 and a friend of hers. And uh, they've been going around trying to plant, uh, trying to find the areas to plant trees. There have been local uh, um, uh, uh, DIY uh, projects, which is the Grow It Yourself projects as well. And there's a, a Actually, what, what is heartening is to see uh, kids more um, bought into, not even bought in, more kind of uh, driving the challenge on making sure there's zero waste, making sure that there's a, um, recycling of, um, of uh, produces. And this is something that they've, they've been trying to drive from home because there's been a lot of being at home and consumption at home. And I think people have started to realize the waste that gets generated in the home as well. So it's great to see, and I've seen it through various online communities that people are driving it. And it's normally the young 
younger generation. And there is a real spirit of community there. But then I've noticed another question from one of your uh, uh, que uh, questions popping up is that, has there been an in inequity as well in terms of uh, communities? Uh, in so far talking of, of pollutions, is it that um, certain more affluent communities will, will, will have less pollutions and, and um, face a climate crisis less? They will face the same challenges, but they will face challenges in different degrees in so far. We have always noticed the division between uh, uh, those who are vulnerable and don't have the means and those who do have the means. And we've noticed through COVID and through climate uh, uh, crisis that it is the most vulnerable that gets affected, the worse it is. So how do we make sure that within our city, so I've been <laughs> using the phrase a lot called, it cannot be postcode lottery. So, um, so it cannot be that you live in a, cer a certain area that you are then, uh, left behind. And when we look at how we fight COVID and how we fight climate, um, uh, the climate crisis, we need to make sure that we are aligned to to be fair on all that we are, all who we are trying to, to work for and protect in, in this community, in this society. Thank you very much. And turning uh, to the Deputy Mayor of Marseille, um, obviously we have, uh, on the one hand, countries struggling with economic and social challenges, indeed tensions of various kinds. These have been made worse by the pandemic. And on the other hand, there is the climate emergency, which you are asking citizens to address. How do you, how do you reconcile those two? And in a way it does touch on the issues around social justice that Hazel just referred to. I'm delighted that I can answer this question because I wanted to say that uh, obviously ecology is uh, also related to the social aspects. So obviously social justice is a key aspect for us as well. Um, obviously we try to uh, fight against climate change and obviously we need everybody, even the weakest, um, so that everybody's lives is easier. And in fact, um, this pandemic showed how important that was and going back to what was said before, I mean, relocating was important was important as well and eating local food and uh, trees everywhere in all neighborhoods in Marseille, in all areas, you should be able to uh, have access to other types of mobility as well. And this was highlighted by the pandemic. So obviously this can be a key social and political um, aspects as well for sustainability and social justice. Uh, obviously we fight for the inhabitants and their uh, challenges as well. But what do they want basically in Marseille? They want to be able to pay their energy bills and the, uh, the answer to reduce those bills is being eco-friendly with thermal refit because it's not because obviously you have 100% renewable energy that your bill will uh, go down. So it's only to do with refurbishing housing uh, for inhabitants and uh, currently, I mean, these are not efficient at all. So obviously they're too hot in summer, too cold in winter. So we really have to have a major um, refurbishment program, program for housing, especially for the poorest population. So, and this is related to health as well and healthy food for everyone, not only for the wealthiest in Marseille. So in order to have that, you have to obviously go local in Marseille. You have to develop partnerships with and shared gardens, as I mentioned before, and um, we, we want people to spend more time with their children as well. So improve uh, public transport on the whole territory of Marseille. I mean, the poorest population uh, living in the north shouldn't have to be on public transport for an hour and a half to go to the beach in the south of the city. So this is what we want to do. They want to breathe cleaner air. And this is for us to reduce um, air pollution, asking obviously the, uh, the cruise companies in particular to improve their carbon footprint. So, and it's related to employment as well. It's for us as well to guide them towards this transition. So this is why we want in Marseille to implement 
a dedicated space to that we would call uh, the, the Cité de la Transition with three sectors, research, economic players, and training as well, uh, so that the younger generation can be trained to future uh, jobs. And we'll see that uh, there will not be social justice without ecology and vice versa, because obviously this is this means that we have to share resources. This means that we have to uh, better regulate and we have to have a systemic approach that does not exclude anyone at all. And as a conclusion, I would say that uh, regarding this uh, systemic approach and this change in behavior that we have to trigger, is just to say that when you tackle uh, issues in a global way, you will find global solutions that are satisfactory for all the objectives and all the population. Thank you very much for that. We have time for one more question, which in a way builds on, on everything that you have both been saying. Uh, Dublin and Marseille are both uh, European cities. They're both in the, they are within countries who belong to the European Union. What role do you think cities like Dublin and Marseille can play in realizing the goals of the European Green Deal. Uh, could I ask you, Hazel, for your response to that? I think leadership, like, like, and that's what, that's the role. So the role is, is to lead in the area and to show our partners that this is what we need to do. This is the change we need to drive. And I'm, I'm very heartened to hear uh, the Madame Deputy Mayor's words today, because I think there is a real leadership that's being driven. And we, we, we need to be the ones that drive it. I know every city looks at it and go, oh, we'll wait until so-and-so does it next door or a way to see what they do and but I, I think every city needs to lead in 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 their own to show that this can be done uh, and whatever way they do it may be different to their to their neighbors but that it can be done and that feeds into overall um being ambitious towards the European Green Deal and, and understanding that this isn't something that that uh is uh, that that isn't a want. It is very much a necessity that we need to drive this change. Thank you very much, Hazen. And uh, Madam Deputy Mayor, you have the the word, the last word. Well, uh, well, what can I say? Well, obviously, we will strive to uh, lead as many projects as possible for the energy transition, and we really want to try and solve as many issues as possible because for us i mean we have this objective to reach the optimal balance between uh, conditions and life uh, comfort and obviously the pressure on natural resources that's all so what we want for us is to put human beings at the heart of the approach and have a vision that's focused on human beings rather than new technologies or uh, to fight climate change that brings uh, us to an end for uh, with today's uh, discussion. Um, I think it's been very rich and stimulating um, and has opened up new horizons for cooperation, I think, between cities like Dublin and Marseille. I'd like to thank our two guest speakers very, very warmly on behalf of the IIEA and indeed the French Embassy. Um, uh, I thank the audience for their very active participation and the interest in uh, these very challenging issues. Uh, with that, Goodbye to everybody, au revoir to our French friends, and um, thank you once again for uh, contributing to this event. Thank you very much.